I don't have a presentation. I'm just going to speak to you. Last November, I was walking in downtown Washington, D.C., and uh, I got a call on my cell phone from Peru. I didn't recognize the number, but I answered it anyways. And it was an automatic message, a, a machine talking to me from remote forests, off the grid, not near a road. And it was telling me it could hear a chainsaw, and these are the coordinates. So I texted a biologist I knew at Los Amigos Biological Station, and I said, can you check this out? And about 20 minutes later, she said, yes, that's our boatman, Samuel, clearing a fallen tree off of Trail 10. And that's when I realized that technological advances had made stuff small enough, cheap enough, uh, accessible enough that we could really get intelligence under the canopy that would make a difference from conservation. That device that was talking to me was something that Topher White of Rainforest Connections made out of you know, discarded cell phones on a uh, shoestring budget with the AI to recognize chainsaws or shotguns or whatever. And he and Andy Whitworth uh, from OSA Conservation had climbed up a great big canopy tree and installed it a year previously. And there's no reason why that technology can't be on the border of every national park, every indigenous community, providing real-time alerts to people with cell phones who can take action, whether they're government or whether they're community uh, leaders. So I wanted to talk about the fact that we're now entering a phase where real deployment of these things under the canopy and on the ground and on the water is feasible and cost effective. And I'll just give you an example of some of the things that we're working on this year with more foundation support in that area. For example, now you can move a genomics lab with a, a genomics nanobarcoder reader that's not much bigger than this cell phone into the jungle and run it off the solar panels. You can scoop a bucket of water out of the river and that device will tell you what fish you have in that river with great certainty as to what species. It can even probably start to predict abundance. Someone can catch one of those fish and not have to send a sample of it to some lab in some large city in the country or outside of the country. They can take it to a device right by the river and that will tell you how much mercury uh, is in that fish. And you can take that device and call some community leader or some official with a satellite phone that's this big now uh, and tell them whether that mercury level is safe for pregnant women to consume or not. So these things seem like science fiction 10 years ago. They're not. They're here now and we need to get them deployed in a way that gets this information, as people have said, into a usable form. And the key thing about this is most of it comes to people through a cell phone a highly democratic way to collect and share information. With simple apps, a farmer can photograph an insect they don't recognize, find out if it's an invasive, harmful, exotic, get a name on it, and then get information from organic farmers in Japan about how you control it and become free from the tyranny of a pesticide salesman who's going to sell them something that kills everything and destroys the food chain supporting bats and birds. So what we're seeing now is technology is going to be a democratic way in which citizen scientists and communities can participate in the conservation of these previously difficult areas that you couldn't see into, whether it was satellites or you couldn't see into uh, beneath the canopy. So there's a lot of exciting stuff that is still in development. For example, this year, pandemics permitting, we'll be testing whether you can build a uh, piezoelectric fabric vest and put it on a taper in a peccary. And when that animal moves, the stretching of that fabric generates electricity. That animal can be carrying an acoustic sensor that detects a chainsaw, a shotgun, the hounds of hunters. It can be carrying an aerosol sniffer that can uh, tell if a fire is burning upwind. And the animal itself can participate in the management of a forest and uh, its own salvation. So this becomes very important in these remote wilderness areas. For example, just to the north of this area where I got that chainsaw alert, 
our uncontacted indigenous people who for a century have been living in voluntary isolation, went there to escape slavery and the rubber boom and are still there, extremely vulnerable to things like COVID-19 and already being invaded by illegal loggers. How can we be in those forests without actually physically being there? We can only be there through conservation technologies in the sky and on the ground. That's the only way we're gonna protect these remote wilderness people uh, at risk at genocide and habitats that are so wild and off the grid that governments can't really have an effective presence on the ground without the assistive technology. So I think it's an extremely exciting time uh, and now's the time to both be trying stuff out in the treetops and also deploying it and seeing what works and what doesn't work uh, right now. It's not science fiction, it's here, we can do it. Thank you.